Oh, you who believe, give charity for the pleasure of Allah. The pleasure of Allah. Oh, you who believe, read the Quran every night of Ramadan. Night of Ramadan. Welcome, O oh Ramadan. It is Ramadan. It is Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, the mercy, and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. And welcome to the show Ramadan A Date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we will be discussing the topic from this Ramadan to the next Ramadan. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakia. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, I've got some bad news for you. I'm afraid it's the last in the series of programs today. May Allah accept it from us, inshallah. I mean, inshallah. But it's good news because I'm sure that you're very busy and you can continue all your work in the dawah to our non Muslim brothers and sisters all around the world, inshallah. inshallah. I would like to ask you a question on the topic regarding, you know, what are we going to do after Ramadan ends and until the next one comes? Because we seem to be in a state of spiritual loss after Ramadan. So this is why, obviously, we're having this program. And this will give enthusiasm and motivation for the brothers and sisters, inshallah, to continue all the righteous acts that they've been involved with throughout the 30 days of Ramadan, inshallah. inshallah. So in one line, how can the Muslim brothers and sisters around the world remain steadfast from what they achieved in Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah, wa ala ali wa sahibi ajma'in, amma abad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim, bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim, rabbi shahli sadri, wa yisalli amri, wa ahlul uqdat min lisani yafqahu kawli. If a Muslim goes through the month of Ramadan, and he fasts during the day, and he offers the night prayer during the night, and he's accustomed to doing the good deeds, then inshallah, he should continue doing the same things throughout the year. This is the sign of a true believer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever watching. Indeed, steadfastness after the month of Ramadan, it is the greatest sign what a person has achieved in the month of Ramadan. And a person who is steadfast after Ramadan and he continues doing the good deeds, all the farais and night prayers and sunnah, etc. It is one of the best signs that his fasting has been accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a sign of acceptance. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 30. In case those who say, our Lord is Allah, and they stand firm, straight and with steadfastness and angels descend on them from time to time and they say fear ye not nor you grieve and inshallah glad tidings will descend on you of the eternal bliss that is jannah paradise which is promised for people like you allah repeats the message in surah Al-Kaf, chapter number 46 verse number 13 that indeed those who say that Allah is our Lord and stand firm and steadfast, on them shall be no grief, nor will they have any fear. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in the hadith of Sayyid Muslim, volume number one, in the book of purification, hadith number 450, Muhammad said that the five daily prayers and one Jummah Salah to the next Jummah Salah and one Ramadan to the next Ramadan. These are the periods for the expiration of your sins. As long as you abstain from major sins, all these acts, five daily prayers, Jummah to Jummah Salah, and Ramadan to Ramadan, as long as you abstain from the major sins, doing these acts, it's expiation of your sins. So once you fast in the month of Ramadan, properly following all the commandments of Allah, and then stay steadfast, 
and the next Ramadan, inshallah, all your sins except for the major, they'll be forgiven. It's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number one, in the Book of Faith, Hadith number 62. The beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi once did the person who comes to him and he asks him that, O oh Prophet, tell me regarding the deen of Islam something which after which I will not have to go to anyone besides you. And the Prophet said, believe in Allah and remain steadfast in it. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 27, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will establish those firm in faith who believe in the word and then stand firm and steadfast. And Allah will let astray those who do wrong. From this verse of the Quran, we come to know that a person should be steadfast in faith and inshallah those are the people who are the righteous people. The beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, it's mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari, volume number seven, in the book of Dress, hadith number 5861. Hadith Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she says, that Prophet Muhammad used to construct a room with the Hasir and pray in it during night time. And daytime he used to flatten it and sit on it. Later on, when people came to know, they started praying along with the Prophet. And the group kept on increasing. And when it increased to a large number, the Prophet turned and told them that, do the deeds how much you can do. But be constant in it, even though it is few. That being constant is important. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not get tired of giving rewards. But you can get tired. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, hadith number 6465. Hadith Aisha, she narrates, that the Prophet said, the most loved deed by Allah are those deeds that are done constantly, even though they're few. So the Prophet said, do those deeds which you're able to do. Don't overburden yourself. And Allah loves those deeds which are constant, even though they're few. So, it's the duty of every Muslim that after the month of Ramadan, he should remain steadfast in their faith. If he used to fast in the month of Ramadan, yet he has opportunities to do the voluntary fast which the Prophet has recommended throughout the year. If a person used to pray at night time during the month of Ramadan every day, he can yet pray at night time after Ramadan. If he used to give zakat al-fitr towards the end of the month of Ramadan, he can give charity throughout the full year. And all the good deeds that is to do, whether reading the Quran in the month of Ramadan, he can continue throughout the year. So a person, whatever good he has achieved in the month of Ramadan, he should remain steadfast in it. And that is the sign of acceptance. And these are the people who will be prosperous. Jazakallah And I think that there's adequate information there for the people to take heed and continue the good, righteous actions that they've accumulated and made constant in this month of Ramadan. Next question is, what exactly do you think an ideal condition of a Muslim that has gone through the whole month of Ramadan and has come out to the end now? What is the ideal condition? The ideal condition or the desired condition of a true Muslim after the month of Ramadan should be that first and foremost, he should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making him able to fast during the full month of Ramadan and as well as of a Qiyam in the month of Ramadan. The condition of a true Muslim is better after Ramadan than what it was when Ramadan started. And his good deeds should have increased. And because of the whole institution of fasting in the month of Ramadan, and the true believers, they really fear that have their deeds been accepted or not. And the righteous predecessors, always they competed with each other in the righteous work and to strive for perfection in the good deeds, but hoping that it will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fearing that it should not be rejected. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number 27, that Allah accepts the sacrifice of those who are righteous. That means being righteous is very important. And it's mentioned in a hadith of Rimedi, hadith number 3175, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. She asked the Prophet regarding a verse of the Quran, those that are given what they are given and they tremble with fear, are these the people who drink alcohol and they steal? 
So the Prophet replies, O daughter of a Siddiq, she was the daughter of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. So the Prophet says, O daughter of a Siddiq, these are the people who fast and they pray and they give charity. These are the people who fear that has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the deed or not. And they are the people who rush to do good deeds and they are the one to do it first. So here is talking about the state of a true believer that they do good deeds yet they hope that may it be accepted and they fear that it will be rejected. So in the month of Ramadan a person does good deeds, he fasts etc. And a true believer state is such it continues throughout the year until next Ramadan. But unfortunately there are some Muslims who are very pious only during the month of Ramadan. They may offer five times Salah, they may fast during the month of Ramadan, they may pray the Qiyam, Salah and do all good deeds. But the moment Ramadan goes away, all these acts vanish from their life. Some of them are even neglectful of their prayers. Some don't pray Jama'a Salah, some don't even get up for the Fajr Salah. When they read the Quran in the month of Ramadan, they no longer read. And it's a pity that the deeds, they vanish after the month of Ramadan. As though that they believed in Allah only in the month of Ramadan. It's a pity and it's a wrong thing. As though the Muslims believe that Allah is only in the month of Ramadan and the other months he doesn't exist. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he make us and all of us be steadfast as we were in the month of Ramadan throughout the year until the next Ramadan, inshallah. Ameen, inshallah. Well, Dr. Zakia, I agree with you. and I think it's very, very sad that um, so many of us neglect our deen after the month of Ramadan. But perhaps you could persuade some of us to retain some of the good deeds that we've accumulated and we've started doing during the month of Ramadan by telling us what are the means by which we can continue doing those righteous actions after the month of Ramadan and beyond, inshallah. Number one is to ask the support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to ask His help. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 160, if Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So first and foremost, we should seek the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Him to guide us on the right track and see to it that He keeps us steadfast after the month of Ramadan. And the best dua a person can make is what Allah has mentioned in His book, the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 8, where Allah says, Rabbana, la tuzi qulubana, baadi dhaytana, wahablana, min ladun karema, inna kantal wahab. Which means, our Lord, let not our hearts deviate. After thou has guided us, grant us mercy from thy own presence. For thou art grantor of bounties without measure. This is one of the best dua that a person can read, especially after the month of Ramadan. That, Rabbana, la tuzi qulubana, baadi dhaytana, wahablana, Oh Lord, let not our hearts deviate after thou hast guided us. Grant us mercy from thine own presence. For thou art granter of mercy without measures. I purposely repeat it because it's very important though. Number two, a person should be in the company of the righteous. His friend circle, the people who he live with, should be righteous people, should be on the straight path, should be true believers, so that that helps him to be on the straight path, on the steadfastness, what he was during the month of Ramadan. Point number three, he should attend Islamic lectures, Islamic talks, Islamic seminars, Islamic conferences, should visit Islamic organizations, which will help him to be on the straight path and come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Point number four, he should watch Islamic programs on the videotapes, on the CDs, on the DVDs, on the television and so that he gets more and more knowledge of the deen and gets him closer to the deen of Islam. He should go to authentic Islamic sites on the internet that will help him to be steadfast. He can listen to audio tapes of the Islamic scholars. He can read books. He should read the translation of the glorious Quran. He should read the Sahih Hadith, translation of the Quran as I mentioned earlier International, a good translation, translation by Abdullah Yusuf Ali, by Mohsin Khan, all is a good translation of the Quran. As far as the book of Hadith are concerned, we have Sayyid Bukhari, Sayyid Muslim, Sunan Abu Dawood, Sunan Nisai, 
Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, etc. We have the Seerah of the Prophet, one of the good books is Rahik al Maktoum by Sheikh Safir Ahmad Barpuri, and so on and so forth, which will keep him on the right track. Further, he should see to it that he does all his obligatory acts, whether it be praying five times a day, whether giving charity, if he has not performed Hajj, he should perform if he has the means to, and so on and so forth. He should increase his supererogatory acts, the nafil acts, the nawafil, so that will get him closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and keep him steadfast. All nawafil acts. He should do more dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. He should read the Quran as much as possible and remember as much as possible. And what he remembers, he should recite in the Quran so that it becomes part of his memory. Furthermore, which is very important, he should abstain from things which take him away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which are khutwa to shaitan. Watching un-Islamic television programs, watching un-Islamic movies, hearing un-Islamic songs, listening to music, going to un-Islamic websites, all these things are khutwa to shaitan, which takes the person away from the straight path. And lastly, he should again pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help him to be on the straight path and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repent if he has made any mistake and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all that good he has done to him and to keep him on the straight path. Jazakallah khair. Dr. Zakir, why is it that Muslims can't continue worshipping Allah with the same enthusiasm and zeal after the month of Ramadan? One of the main reasons for this is because many Muslims, they consider the acts done in the month of Ramadan more as a custom, more as a tradition, that it's a custom, we have to fast in the month of Ramadan, we have to pray tarawih in the month of Ramadan, we have to do good deeds. More of a custom, it is not for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many people who offer tarawih, that is the Qiyamul Layl, very religiously, but unfortunately, they miss many of the Fard Salah, yes. which is absolutely wrong, because the Fard Salah is a Fard, and Taraweeh is not a Fard, it's a Sunnah Muqidah, it's Mustahab. So because of this, more of a custom, Ramadan being more of a custom, more of a tradition, that's the reason that once Ramadan is over, they forget everything, as I mentioned earlier, that as though Allah is only there in the month of Ramadan and not in the other months. Point number two is because the surrounding and the atmosphere which is there in the month of Ramadan does not remain after Ramadan is over. So if they, as I mentioned earlier, if they keep righteous friends and company of good people, then the chances of being steadfast is much more. And thirdly, that because of weak faith, many a time the act of righteousness keeps on becoming less and less. In the starting of Ramadan, people are enthusiastic and they overdo it sometimes. Therefore, we find that the mosques are filled during the first starting nights for Taraweeh, for Qiyamul Layl, and later on it keeps on decreasing and towards the end of Ramadan, it becomes the least. So a person should not overdo the act out of zeal and enthusiasm, as the Prophet said, that the act should be constant, that's better, even though it's few, rather than, you know, doing many and doing for a short time. So a person should do acts which are constant and should be strong in faith. And the last point is that as it's mentioned in the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muslim Ahmad, volume number two, page number 230, hadith number 7148, that the beloved Prophet said that in the month of Ramadan, the Satans, the devils, they are chained and the doors of paradise are open and the gates of hell are closed. So, but natural, the temptation is there during the month of Ramadan because the devils are chained. The moment Ramadan gets over, the temptation is more, the devil is more after you, so more chance of you to deviate from the truth. And in the month of Ramadan, the gates of hell are closed, the doors of heaven are open, so more chance of doing good deeds. So these are the few points which are the reasons why a person does not remain steadfast after the month of Ramadan. How can we overcome these shortcomings which make us seemingly worse after Ramadan sometimes rather than better? How can we overcome the shortcomings which lead us into this situation. First, we Muslims should realize that Ramadan is not a sort of tradition or a custom that we have to pray and fast, you know, and only do these acts because it's a particular time period. It should rather be to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's a fard. And if you do it the right way, it will remain throughout the year, inshallah. And Allah says in the Quran, 
it's for Hijar, chapter 15, verse number 99. And serve thy Lord until the hour is certain. That means until your death. That doesn't mean you only serve and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month of Ramadan. Serve him throughout your life till the last day of your life, till you die. And we should strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should be with people who are righteous after the month of Ramadan is over. We should be with people who are righteous, who are on the straight path, so that, as the Quran says, that help each other in birr and taqwa. We have to guide each other and help each other to strengthen each other's faith, so that we are on the right path. And we should not find it difficult to perform acts of worship. We should not find it as boring or as burdensome, because people don't know the real reason. That's the reason they feel. It is boring, etc. And we have to strive for the right thing. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah An Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 69. If you strive in our path, we will open up our pathways for you. If you jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, jihad fi sablillah, strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will make the task easy for you. And the hadith of the Prophet, وسلم, which is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number 4, hadith number 6778, where the beloved Prophet وسلم, said that paradise is surrounded by hardships and hell is surrounded by temptations. You know, so people think it's very hard to do all these acts of worship and the good deeds and they're tempted by the Satan towards the hell. So we should avoid the khutwa to shaitan, that's the footsteps of the devil, and stay on the straight path, that's very important. And we should see to it that we should strive in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's way. And these hardships will benefit us in this world as well as in the akhirah. And the best dua for this is that we lay our life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 162, which says that, Inna salati wa nusuki wa ma yahya wa mati lillahi rabbil alameen. That verily my prayers and my service for sacrifice and my life and my death are all for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the cherisher of all the worlds. So we tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we pray to him that my prayer is only to you and my service and my sacrifice for you alone. My life and my death is for you alone, the Lord of all the worlds. And then inshallah, Allah will keep us on the straight path and that will help us to be steadfast in the next Ramadan. Inshallah. And I mean, may Allah <laughs> put us all in that condition, inshallah. inshallah. Dr. Zakia, since uh, Ramadan is the month of, that trains your mind towards patience, could you tell the viewers about the significance of patience? As far as the word patience is concerned, that is sabr, it's mentioned in the Quran 102 times. And it is one of the most important virtues in Islam. And through patience, you can come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quran says in several places that Allah is with those who are patient. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 45, that seek Allah's help with patience, perseverance, and prayer. And it is indeed hard, except for those who are humble. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 153, Ya am sabri wa salah, inna Allah ma sabri. That, oh you believe, seek Allah's help with patience, perseverance, and prayer. For verily, Allah is with those who patiently persevere. Allah repeats a similar message in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 155 to verse number 157, that surely we will test you with something of fear and hunger, with loss of goods and lives and fruits of toils. And those are successful, those who patiently persevere. And the verse continues, and when struck with a the calamity, they say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajiun. That from Him we come and to Him we return. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we come and to Him is our return. We Allah talks about patience, about perseverance. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 200, that, O oh, you believe, persevere in patience and constancy and strengthen each other so that you may prosper. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse number 150, and be steadfast in patience, for verily Allah will not suffer 
the reward of those who are righteous. Allah repeats a message in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 127, that be patient, for verily patience is from Allah. And one of the criteria to go to Jannah is sabr, that's patience. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, Wal Asr, inna al-insan al illa lazin amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqq wa tawasaw bil sabr. Indeed, mankind is in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. So one of the criteria to go to Jannah is that you should have sabr. The minimum four criteria to go to Jannah, Iman, righteous deeds, exhorting people to truth, exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of them is missing, under normal circumstances, you shall not go to Jannah. Because Allah says that patience is a requirement. If Allah wants to forgive you, it's a different question. As Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48, and Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116, if Allah pleases, He may forgive anything. But the sin of shirk, He will not forgive. But under normal circumstances, if any one of these four criteria are missing, you shall not enter Jannah. And one of them is sabr. And in the Quran, in Surah Shara, chapter 94, verse 5 and 6, it says, Inna malu suryusra, wa inna malu suryusra. After every difficulty, there is reward. After every difficulty, there is success. That means hard times are there, but inshallah, in the end, there is success. So we have to be on the straight path, we have to do sabr. And the translation of sabr, as I mentioned, it is patience. It leads to self-restraint. And sabr also means constancy. It means forbearance. It means endurance, it means perseverance, there are various different shades. And if a person is patient, then it gets in success. A person who is impatient, he gets irritated, he gets angry, he is very short-tempered, he may fire some of his staff, he may lose his school, he may behave badly with other people. So impatiency is very wrong. Think what you can do, you cannot do because of impatiency. And if a person is calm and sober, he can think properly and success is more closer to him. An impatient person, he gets violent, he gets irritated, he gets frustrated and the thing which he can do cannot be done. Rather patience converts a thing which I can't do into a thing which I can do. And patience is very important for success in this world as well as the Akhira. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rid us of these negative qualities and allow us to have sabr and succeed ultimately in the hereafter, inshallah. Next question, Dr. Zakia, relates to the fact that now, of course, Ramadan is over and the devils are set free. Many of the youth, not to mention other people, <laughs> um, adults as well, will revert to their bad habits of watching television. Could you shed some light on the issue of watching television and its harmful effects. Television does multiple times more harm than good. It harms a person spiritually, morally, socially, and economic wise. There are various, we can give a talk only on the ill effects of only on television. Number one is that I call it rather, it's a khutwa to shaitan. It's the footstep of the devil for many reasons. Number one is that it many a time prevents a person from offering salah. A person gets addicted to the TV. So Muslims, though he realizes the time, he says, okay, I'll pray after five minutes, after five minutes, and he watches the program, the soap or the opera or whatever it is, and he misses salah. Number two, there is too much of obscenity on the television. Normal channels that you see, the entertainment channels, you find so much of obscenity. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman, if any unashamed thought, any brazen thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. The next verse speaks for the woman, Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse number 31. Say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. That when she looks at any man and any unashamed thought comes, she should lower the gaze. So now, how can a Muslim watch television on which you find ladies without hijab, immodest, many of them, the clothes that they wear, 
they expose more of the body than cover the body. So, but natural, most of the channels that you see, more than 99%, you can safely say, more than 99% are haram, as far as Islam is concerned. People give excuses, oh, why not news channels? Living news channels. The ladies that they come, you know, they dress up, they're not having hijab, etc. And the obscenity that is there, it is tremendous. And there are many reports, which if time permits, I'll tell you later on. And the second is obscenity on the television. Number three is the extravagance. That when we see any channel, the advertisements, they entice a person to buy things which are not required. You may see a latest car that's launched in the market and your desire will be there to buy it. You may want a very big house or things which aren't required of luxury extravagance as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 26 and 27. They do not be extravagant, do not be a spendthrift. For verily, the person who's a spendthrift is the brother of the devil. The fourth point is that it leads unnecessary. There's too much of glamour and fame. The person tries to get involved in that glamorous world, seeing the actors and the other people, and they try and imitate them, they try and emulate them. They become the idols and they become the heroes rather than Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and the Sahabas. Number five is that there's too much of violence on the television. And that really influences the person's lifestyle. And there are several reports on that too. Furthermore, there's too much of drug addiction, there's too much of fighting, etc., which a person gets involved, you know. Oh, some people, you know, it's nice to have drugs. When a person, a young person sees that, he tries to at least try it out. And that's how drug addiction increases, alcohol increases, and there are various. Just to cut short, I'll just give you some of the reports. There's a special report done only on the effect of television on children. And since 1950, more than a thousand surveys and researches were done on the effects of television on children and young adults. And according to a survey which was present in the Senate Committee of Judiciary in USA in 1999, it says that because of young children and young adults watching television, it makes their lifestyle violent, they're aggressive, and they're unsocial. According to the report of Houston, a survey was conducted in 1992, by the time a child reaches the age of 10, and if he watches television, the average hours that a person in the USA watches, he would have viewed 200,000 violent acts on television and 40,000 murders. Imagine what impact it will have on that young mind. According to a report, of the American Council of Pediatrics in the year 2001, it says that death in children and young adults and adolescents only due to violence, that is homicide, suicide and trauma, is much more than the diseases, much more than cancer, much more than congenital heart disease, the deaths caused by these violence. And furthermore, according to research done by the Kaiser, Foundation in the 2005, it said that on an average, an average American child watches television every week for 44 and a half hours. That means every day he watches television and sits in front of the computer game or in front of the computer screen, all put together for about six and a half hours every day. That is, there's no other activity he does more than sitting in front of the television screen or the computer screen, more than sleeping. Sleeping is the only thing where he may sleep more. Otherwise, any activity that he does, maximum is this. And the impact it has on the lifestyle, on the behavior is drastically negative. There were researches done on what effect does a video album has. You know, you have a lot of video albums coming up and dancing and singing and music. It takes a person away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, I say it's khutu atu shaitan. There are researches on the sex shown on this television. It's tremendous. Maximum number of channels on the satellite TV in America, it's pornographic channels. In UK, it's pornographic channels. The maximum profit, the percentage of profit made by any channels are the pornographic channels. And the cheapest to run a channel is the pornographic channel. And even the entertainment channels have started getting obscenity on it to attract the people. And people get slowly and slowly alluded towards it. And India, which is the conservative country, the eastern part of the world, maybe a few decades back when we see the way the movies were made in India, if they had to show a love scene, they used to show two flowers. That's it, indicating love scene. Later on, we had the hero-heroine, they're running around the tree. 
you should have seen. Now, you see them openly kissing on the street, Indian movies, even sleeping in bed, and it's very normal. So that's how, you know, it started with just showing a symbolic lovemaking was flowers, and then we see today that open, openly sleeping and showing all the scenes and all, and it's even getting into the normal film television channels. Then you have the fashion TV and all these, you know. Therefore, we are very particular that in our school, all the children who are studying in our school, in their house, in their family, there should be no cable TV. Even if they want to see peace TV, if they have a private dish where only peace TV comes, it's permitted. But if they have the cable TV along with peace TV, if another 100 or 80 haram channels come, we say, don't see peace TV. Well, the Islamic Sharia says, let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. So the bigger loss is the haram channels. The small benefit is the peace TV. But best is to have only peace TV. Have a decoder, see the channel, that's fine. And there are very few channels which are Islamic and getting people to the straight path. Very few. The percentage will be less than 1% of the channels. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have more channels. And even the Islamic channels should see to it that they're on the Quran and Sunnah, that's important. Because even they get deviated with this media, the film industry, you know, trying to get more popular, slowly, slowly, they try and deviate. So we pray that we be on the straight path. So this is just in short, the few ill effects of TV and we can give a talk on this. And finally, Dr. Zakia, what are your, well, to sum up, what are your final parting words of advice to the viewers on the number of interviews that we've had during this month of Ramadan on the topic of Ramadan? As I had mentioned in the first episode, that all the answers that I gave, I'm a student of knowledge, I'm not a scholar. All the answers, all the questions you asked me and all the answers that I gave, they were given by the other scholars. I consider myself to be a student of knowledge, talib ilm But the only thing that I did is, I went through the various answers given by different scholars, and I checked up and I gave the references. These are great scholars, they are nothing. And I quoted those scholars who are on the Quran and Sahih Hadith. So I know that because, as I mentioned earlier, that as far as the month of Ramadan is concerned, directly there are only four verses in the Quran. Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 183, verse number 184, verse number 185, and verse number 187. Only four verses. Directly, indirectly, other verses are there. Most of the answers are from the Hadith. So, but some of the scholars gave answers which are from Zayf Hadith, from Maudu Hadith. So that's what I did. I only quoted those scholars who give the answer from the Sahih Hadith. There may be some of the viewers who may have felt dejected, who may have felt bad that my answer didn't tally with the answer that they had in mind. So I apologize and tell them sorry, but the truth is there. What I did was only went through the various answers and presented the answers which was more close to Quran and the Sahih Hadith. That's all. But all the answers, none of them are my own answers. It has been given by some scholar or the other because they have the right to give fatwa. I don't have a right to give fatwa. Only thing I did that I presented, I collected it and gave the references. And while giving references, I made it a point that since our interview is in English, all those hadiths that are translated in English, I quoted from the English source. As far as the Quran is concerned, all my quotations were from the English translation of the Quran of Abdul Yusuf Ali and uh, Sai International. And as far as the hadith were concerned, all the hadiths are not translated into English. Most of the Qutb al-Sitta have been translated, except for Sunan Tirmidhi. Some of it not completely translated. So the references that I gave are mainly from the English translation of the Hadith. The most common that I quoted is Sahih Bukhari. I gave the translation from the English translation done by Muhammad Mohsen Khan, which was published by Darus Salaam in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. My translation references of Sai Muslim were from the book which was translated by Abdul Hamid Siddiqui and published from Dar al Arabiya, that's in Beirut, Lebanon. The hadith is from Sunan Abu Dawud. The references and the translation was the one done by Professor Ahmad Hassan. The publishers were from Kitab Bhavan, New Delhi, India. The translation from Sunan Nisai, the references and the translation, the English translation done by Muhammad. 
Iqbal Siddiqui and the publishers were Qadi publications from Lahore, Pakistan and of Sunan Ibn Maja, the English translation was done by Muhammad Tufil Ansari and the publishers were Qadi publication, Lahore, Pakistan and the other English translation which I quoted was Muatta which was done by F. Amir Amatraji which was published from Dar al-Fikr from Beirut, Lebanon. So these main seven sources of hadith translated into English which I quoted very often the references were mainly from the English because sometimes it differs from the Arabic source so people in the check they may find it to be different. As far as the other books of hadith they were mainly in Arabic. So the references are mainly of the Arabic like Sunan Tirmidhi, Musnad Ahmad, Sunan Bahaki, also Musaddaq al-Hakim, Musannaf ibn Abi Shaiba, Musannaf Abdul Razak, Sayy ibn Khuzayma, Sayy ibn Hibban, Sayy At-Targib, Sayy Jamia, Sisal Asayya, Tabrani, and etc. etc. So just to make it a note, because normally when I give references, when people verify they should go to the right source that I've given from. So just my advice that this was a little bit what I could do in my way in trying to give to the English audience an overall view of Ramadan. May Allah accept it from me. And all the good and all the right thing that I said is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all the wrong thing is from me and from the shaitan. And I ask Allah for forgiveness for that. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept my effort, your effort, and the efforts of the viewers in trying to strive in his way and trying to come closer to his path. May Allah accept it. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Alhamdulillah. I think you've virtually said everything that I was going to say, <laughs> alhamdulillah. But uh, suffice it to say that um, it's been a pleasure uh, to, uh, you know, interview you over these 30 or so days. It has been my pleasure too. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I'm glad of that as well. And uh, I think that um, this is something we've set up now, which is probably going to continue next year and the year after, inshallah, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us the life in our limbs inshallah. to continue the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his work his righteous work in giving knowledge of the Qur'an and, and the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the whole of humanity as it has been described in the Qur'an. This is what it's all about. Well, Dr. Zakir, Jazakallah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for all your effort over the last 32 days. Reward you too, man. Immensely enjoyable, as I've said to you before. Alhamdulillah. Allah reward you, inshallah. Inshallah. Brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, viewers of Peace TV, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you steadfast upon the deen from this Ramadan until the next Ramadan. You and us. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> مسلمين مؤمنين للإله عابدين شهونا صوم وعتق وقنوة فيه صدق يومنا صبر ورق بدموع البائسين رمضان قد أهل بالصيام وأطل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتوفي